welcome one and all. I would love to know how everybody is tonight, today, and maybe tomorrow, and whenever people get a chance to watch this episode. And uh, the way to do that is to subscribe, give us some feedback, and put some comments in there underneath the video. That would be great. We try to respond to all those. And uh, thanks all so much for being here with us tonight. Um, we're going to get our uh, standard community guidelines out of the way real quickly here. Our video does not claim to give medical, legal, political, or financial advice. We offer it for your entertainment, even if it's a little bit challenging sometimes. The points of view and purpose here is not to incite fear, violence, harass, or bully in any way, but to share opinions and thoughts with other like-minded individuals, because we're all curious, or at least many of us are. Uh, this video and our channel in general may contain certain copyrighted works that were not specifically authorized to be used by the copyright holder, but which we believe in good faith are protected by federal law and the fair use doctrine for one or more of the reasons noted in the Copyright Act of 1976. Uh, we've got, uh, every so often, I take a step back and, um, and, I, and I just ponder everything. Uh, we, you know, it's very easy for us to get our heads way deep into things and into the nitty gritty and the facts of a specific device. And we'll be doing some of that tonight, be rest assured. Um, but every once in a while, I like to just uh, consider uh, the whole picture. So can we talk for a minute? And some of the, some of the thoughts that flooded through my mind today as I was going about my daily business were, what is the ultimate reality. Here we are looking at technology and devices, but what is, what's the bottom line? Perhaps there is something at a quantum level and that ultimate reality exists only at that very deep and very spooky quantum level. What if what we know to be reality is actually a holographic projection? Indeed, it could be a holographic projection in the mind of a creator. There has to be some prime mover, that there has to be some source intelligence from which everything around us springs. And there are so many unanswered questions. I, I, I went on from this. I said, well, let's look at today's technology. And we've been talking about artificial intelligence for the last few weeks. And what if artificial intelligence has already got a grapple hold on the future of the world and we don't even know it yet? Even as we speak, it's already gained enough momentum and enough tentacles out there um, in, in, in the cyber world and in all of the silicon devices uh, that, 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 that we have software embedded in, that maybe it's actually working with itself at some level and we don't even know it. Is anybody that designed it in full control of it? That would be another interesting question. You've got various groups of people that design various devices. And there's a certain amount of onboard intelligence with each one of these things. And did, did all of the people who designed all these separate devices ever have a big, you know, a, a big convention and say, well, we did this and this can be communicated with that way. And this one does this and this one has this input output. And so when you put it all together, they're all actually really talking to each other or they're all ready to be able to learn to talk to each other. And here I go, you know, this is my science fiction mind just going crazy. So I look and I say, well, gee, five decades from now, will the world be completely run by machines, which could be a completely liberating experience for humanity if it's done right under the right conditions? Or will those machines be running our world and dictating to us the way it's going to be, which is more or less the subject of what we were talking about last week? What if? What if such technologies, such as 5G, and 5G is really just fifth generation communications, but it brings in a whole lot of other things, including very high speed, uh, very wide bandwidth, uh, multi-band, all sorts of things. What if it is actually vastly more powerful than we even know? What if, and we, we have reason to believe that there's a whole lot of history from our, our past, and some of it may be our distant past, that, that we have not learned. It just hasn't been part of the curricula in our school books when we went to school and learned, and it oriented us to what we thought our world was. What if there is a whole lot more real, actual history that is hidden, and a potential, uh, knowing that history, a potential much more accurate trajectory of what a future might be 
than we can even know. Because if you understand the past and you understand where you're at now, then it's much easier to extrapolate what the future might be. What if there is some huge cataclysmic cosmic event that might happen in the future that is completely out of our control? Everything about the little blue marble of Earth in this vast, vast universe is so much smaller than what that might be. And of course, in cosmological time, uh, you know, a, a few a few million years either way in cosmological time really doesn't make too much difference to the universe. But what if there was something that was impending to come in maybe in the near future? Who knows? And I think about this stuff and it, it, it entertains me. It makes my mind work. It, it gives me a little bit of stress sometimes. Um, and then there's that business of approaching a singularity. And at that point, um, I'm just going to say hi to you, TMC. How are you doing tonight? Now, you can take off with the singularity for a few minutes if you want. But anyway, those are just some of the fun little thoughts that I was I was uh, rolling around in my mind today. Well, hi, Andy. I'm doing good. And I think, I think the singularity is already here. That's just my opinion. But I think it's already here. And I think it's being unfurled very slowly and done in such a way to create the proverbial pyramid that allows those that already understand what's happening to squat and poop on top of everybody else. And that's where I think your work and my work comes into play because what, what if, what if there are multiple timelines and we have some choosing due to the quantum uncertainty of things that there's that there is a whole element of spirituality and free will that would allow us to influence jumping to a different timeline and maybe either diverge away. And this is coming right out of the chat, by the way, you guys uh, either diverge from a potential dismal future or converge into something else. To your point, for those of you that have not seen the movie prisoner X or prisoner 10 Roman numeral 10, I encourage you to do so. It's a very intriguing movie. They talk about the very same thing, this idea of timelines and going back in time to create a, another past, in, implying that the future is in fact set and the, the war, the battle space, if you will, is creating a divergent or additional past in order to, like you said, uh, create multiple timelines. And if we remove time from any equation that we, we perceive, which is difficult for humans to do because right. we're born, right. we live, we die, and everything is on a clock, that's what we're told. If you believe in immortality... On, the, on this terrestrial plane only, which is the only thing that, that's real to us, that the only thing that we can know, the rest of it's imagination. But on this terrestrial plane, you're right. If it isn't linear time, tick, 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 seconds, minutes, hours, days, years, then it's, we just can't deal with it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I think that we can deal with it, provided we have the right prerequisite understanding or knowledge so that we then appreciate the uh, time and space as we perceive it uh, even more. And that's, that's where I think um, the soul and this idea of transcendence or um, life after death, I think that's the best way that humans at this point have been able to describe this notion of no time. And because our paradigm is set in the world that is material, it directly conflicts with everything that we're taught. The rat race, keeping up with the Joneses, whatever cliche you want to use. We that, weren't taught quantum principles. If, if, if we were to have, initial, in, instead of initially being oriented to this linear uh, spatial world, if we were to have started with quantum uh, quantum phenomena and quantum mechanics, the, that 
pr that uh, predicates, well, it, it's predicated upon that, that all points in time exist simultaneously and all points in space are connected. So time is not important in that world. And if we are actually quantum creatures at some level, then we're actually free of the constraints of time and we don't even know it. That's right. And that's the, it's one of the components of the great delusion and instantaneous communication, instantaneous everything, um, which when you read about photonics and what organizations in the Department of Energy and their affiliate laboratories and corporate research and development, when you start reading their uh, publications and their quote unquote discoveries that they're now rolling out after the two billion with the Bravo dollar investment into AI, computer science, and quantum. Um, that that's really what they're. Um, that's that. Those are the. That's the underlying uh, premise. There is that spooky action at a distance. This idea of uh, a change in one place having a known relationship in another, that's really all that's describing. And if we can understand that at a fundamental level amongst the general populace, I think we would all be much nicer to each other because we would realize that our very impulses, in fact, have influence everywhere well, we, all the we've... time. We've proven that connectedness both repeatedly and experimentally and repeatedly. So that that is real. We can reproduce it. That being the case, um, we, we should be then taking the next step in seeing how that relates to the way that we look at life. If we can accept what we can experimentally reproduce, then we should, there's really some, some tricky thinking, some hard thinking for us because our belief systems have been so shaped and so limited, but it, it almost seems like it's time for a freeing of the mind of humanity, both collectively and individually in, this order, is the in issue. order to ascend to the next level. Yeah, this is the issue with that. Um, the, field of science known as quantum or torsion uh, fields, which is just a component of it, I think, really, um, I lost my train of thought. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's all right. I, I can pick up on it. So you remember that document that we were going to get way deep into about a year ago and we haven't got back to it yet? <laughs> the time is coming and we're going to get into that about consciousness. Yeah. Um, all I can say is that ego prevents the scientific community from advancing science faster. And what I mean by that is this, when you have, um, scholars and scientists and engineers spending their entire life working on something, it's very difficult for them to look at another body of work that refutes or challenges everything that they've worked for. Right. And so it's this idea of ego that prevents productivity, efficiency, and um, evolution for that matter, evolution of ideas and, and everything that's associated. And that goes back to the notion of our, our thoughts and our emotions ultimately impacting, whether for good or bad, um, everything. And if the scientific community and academia in general uh, understand that even if on their deathbed, so to speak, that their, their work has been refuted or challenged, that in and of itself is enough, in my view, to be defined as a, as a success, simply because without the, that body of work, maybe perhaps the challenge or the next evolution of the, uh, the science that's been developed may not have occurred. And this goes back again to ego. And if we can understand mm -hmm. collectively that ego has a great deal to do with our ability to move forward as a species, I think we'll make a lot better progress much faster.
Well, I, I agree. And, and uh, there are brilliant scientists. I'm not picking on any scientists, any specialists, any engineers whatsoever. But it's so easy to become very, very much deep down a rabbit hole of what you're working on. And it, 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 you can kind of become myopic and lose sight of the big picture and where the where the real power and where the real advancement and i mean the the transcendence or ascendance of the human race to some other level and i don't profess to know what it is but it's not in one uh rabbit hole that's under a magnifying glass it's a big picture it's a big picture and it seems that some of the things that that we spend, you know, are, are, are wonderful people with resources and intelligence and universities. They spend so much time, energy, and money working on something that is such a small microcosmic part of the world. You, you kind of scratch your head and you say, wow, guys, all right, you've made something, you know, a stupendous invention. This is so ingenious what you built. But what does it mean in the big picture? And there's a lot of that that goes on in this world. Now, some of it starts to translate into some real big things, i.e. quantum computing and uh, networked artificial intelligence. Yes, I grant you. And I don't even know where that's going to end up. That's why I was asking those questions today while I was going through my day. But um, I, I, I think we really need philosophers. We really need spiritual guides. If if I'm not overstepping the the idea, you know, and, and it's not spiritual in any particular religious uh, form, it's just kind of um, what is it to be a human, a full human, a complete human who actualizes all of the potential for growth that they have. Not that we're there yet, but it's a process. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah. Um, what it what it means to me, the, the spiritual guidance piece is more or less the interface between what we understand as consciousness and critical thought. And if we can yeah. under, if we can understand that, we can better understand our emotions and the impact that our emotions have on the way that we manifest our consciousness and critical thought through physical action. And that, to me, is the, the trifecta, if you will, of what makes a human so special. This notion that we have a soul or a consciousness that is able to look at self and how self experiences reality and how self impacts reality. And then, only then, be able to translate that into some physical action. And I think if people understand that there are multiple components that need to be considered of self prior to taking any action, I think more prudence would be manifest with respect to how we treat each other. Absolutely. Yep. It would give better perspective. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Do you want to you want to get into some nuts and bolts of the notion of how AI may already be or is primed to be an integral part of Absolutely. Absolutely. While while keeping in mind this opening discussion and helping us to just, you know, keep right right side by side with everything that we talk about, that bigger perspective. Like what does it mean that because there are a lot of things not to be afraid about with the technology that's all around us today. And the only way to, to not be, you know, not become uh, uh, fearful of it is to understand that it's only a small piece of everything. And so, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's okay. get into it. All right. Well, I'm going to start share. Okay. And we will go from there. I'm looking for the right, this is it right here. So I'm not going to read all this, but I do want you to take some time, if you're able to watch, just to look at some of the key ideas or terms here, because this is where uh, medical and health and technology and science are going to converge in order to regulate and or manage the species. 
And when I say regulate or manage, I'm not saying that strictly in a negative sense. There is a lot of trauma and a lot of damage that has been done to everybody who, in my view, is alive today because we were all born into some form or another of slavery. And in order to accelerate our growth as a species, this idea of artificial intelligence, and integrating uh, technology with humans has the potential to thrust us forward into a renaissance, provided we do it in a safe, meaningful way. And this is, this is where it's going. Neuroscience and artificial intelligence are about to revolutionize medicine, especially psychiatry. Psychiatry is largely based on a patient's subjective report of symptoms. Neurotechnologies offer a range of complementary new tools based on objective and empirical data, which will revolutionize the diagnosis and prevention of psychiatric pathologies. It says here we're entering an era of computational medicine where digital technologies such as magnetic resonance imaging and electroencephalography will play a major role in unraveling the mysteries of mood anxiety, and depression. It talks here that the World Health Organization says nearly 1 billion, with a B, people in the world suffer from a mental disorder. And they say it's a figure that's constantly increasing due to the impact of COVID-19. They're talking about personalized and integrated medicine with technology and neuroscience, right, that would combine objective science, and customized therapies. They're saying is becoming a necessity in helping to alleviate some of the major difficulties that psychiatry faces. Computational psychiatry, clinical protocol embodied by the intake of medication, hmm, would be accompanied by a multi-dimensional analysis, would take into account objective criteria such as electroencephalography and subjective criteria through personalized psychotherapy, more oriented towards finding deep meaning for the patient. Computational psychiatry, the crossroads of digital psychiatry, big psychiatry, and psychiatry modeling. And this is a good graphic of what big data, the cloud, AI, and companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, IBM, and all of your affiliated telecommunications companies. This is what they are after. Big data is equivalent to gold or oil or any other natural raw material. And what I'm talking about here is this notion of intellectual property, intellectual property being whatever is coming in and going out of your brain and your body in order to uh, understand more holistically an individual and then through that understanding, fuse individuals together into some type of global population. And this is where the divergence, in my view, between something like a Chinese model versus what I would like to see in America and other countries, something oriented around the Bill of Rights and Constitution, those are the two competing ideologies that exist, the paradigm, if you will, that we are all subjected to. And this is why we need to get our arms wrapped around big tech put a leash on big tech and big telecom so that the species, the people in each and every country can decide what to do with themselves and their countries. Mm -hmm. That that's really the, the bare bones boil down of what the, the current and future battle space is. And these companies that, I'm referring to big tech and big telecom are the infrastructure, the proverbial nervous system that will interconnect everything that is interconnecting everything. These are the new oligarchs. 
these are the new uh, aristocrats and they need to be put in check very, very soon. Yes. Otherwise, do. otherwise this notion, like you said earlier of free will will go away. Right. And in my view, if we don't understand the proverbial Star Trek analogy of the prime directive, if we can't understand that and implement it amongst ourselves throughout the human species, there is no way we're getting off this rock. There is no way. It's not going to happen. It won't be allowed to happen. So the notion of a preservation of free will means that a sovereign nation needs to remain sovereign and then establish an appropriate social contract amongst its population so that an individual and a family also has sovereignty in order to continue to facilitate growth. The Chinese model is the inversion of that, whereby the state has hegemonic control and homogenizes an individual and a family into a collectivist society that does not respect and in fact criminalizes sovereignty at every level. This is where we're going. This is where we are, folks, in my view, for your entertainment purposes only. It says further in this article that according to the World Health Organization, psychiatric disorders would be the leading cause of disability in the world. So they're projecting, the World Health Organization is projecting an increase in psychiatric disorders. That and Psychiatric in intervention. Right. That's going to require psychiatric interven intervention mm -hmm. using the internet as we understand it to control and regulate every aspect of human activity. So from that, we're going to go here. This is DARPA's biotechnologies office. And this article, this, this announcement talks about laying a foundation for a new generation of biotech ventures. And it talks here that uh, are about DARPA uh, being in bed, so to speak, with the Silicon Valley since the 1960s, which means that basically the Silicon Valley is an extension of DARPA. And without going through all of this, some highlights that I found here that were very interesting is something like creating a pandemic-free world vision of a distributed healthcare system that combines technology, mm. um, a real-time window into your body's chemistry, mm. 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 organ on a chip technology. Well, that could be good. Or chips on your organs technology, just saying, and reinventing psychiatry using neurotechnology, using implanted closed loop neural systems and, to and, and, record go ahead and, and honestly that could be so much better than taking someone who's who's uh, let's say unbalanced in some way and just medicating them with prozac or lithium or something so crude as that this is really potentially so much better technology has to advance it will it is advancing and it, and it must advance. It's, it's not about the technology. It's not the, it's not the nemesis. There are those who would like to rule the world and control everything. And then there's the rest of us. Technology is not the enemy. Uh, that was, that's all I had to say there. Sure. Um, on that note, where I see this going on our current trajectory, at least in the public sphere, is something like understanding your <clears throat> your body's chemistry in such a way that you can reduce the dosage of medications that we understand today yep. in order to um, more readily disperse them into our environment without uh, the general public's knowledge. And in order to do that effectively, um, technologies like DREAD, D-R-E-A-D-D-S, uh, which is... Uh, this idea of using designer chemicals to interact with your neurology and your biology. 
where they can take genetic information, insert it into your cells and make your cells much more sensitive to very minute amounts of medication. So it acts like a asymmetrical amplifier. And what that will allow is something like dispersion of lithium in the water supply or fluoride in the water supply in very low doses to have an amplified effect on your biology. That's the bad side. The good side is that something like dreads would enable alleviation of things like blindness or epilepsy or Alzheimer's or potentially arthritis. It's just like you said, it's technology. It's no different than a hammer or a knife or anything else. It's, it's how it's used. And the boil down of that is what is the intent? Developing technology, in my view, is not bad. It is a matter of how it's deployed and implemented, which goes back to this notion of what is intent. Another thing here is uh, reinventing psychiatry using neurotechnology, and mind flight. If you research mind flight, you'll see video games, but there's also bits and pieces online that talk about this notion of <clears throat> direct neural control of complex physical systems. And this is where uh, the military is going. In my view, they're already there. I don't think the troops realize it yet, but if you're able to monitor an individual's neural activity, you're able to understand if they're stressed, if they're tired, if they're hurt, if they're uh, a patriot or, or not. And we know that in the last few months, uh, a lot of um, things have been happening to the military that uh, suggest that there is a, requ a requirement at this point from high level, or, yeah, high level generals to um, partake in political uh, action. And that is not the role, in my view, of the military. Mm. That's just my opinion. Agreed. And, and when we move forward through our talk today, I will show you just exactly how uh, some of the nuts and bolts of that works. Memory enhancement in everyday life, focusing on non-invasive electrical and auditory stimulation technologies to enhance memory by facilitating the neural replay process. Now, wow! If you, it, that right, could be if, good for practicing music and getting things right. It could also be good for making spec ops guys commit suicide. Ouch! Hmm. And. Yeah, so this is this technology is not a game at all. This right. stuff is right. lethal and potent. So let's let's move forward. DARPA on your mind, February two thousand four. Applied science may once again play a decisive role in changing the face of armed conflict, the rest of and the rest of human affairs by shifting the battlefield to our very brains. The National Security Establishment and particularly Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, supports research at the intersection of neuroscience and national security that could ultimately enable authorities to do things like enhance or muddle or erase, erase memory monitor crowds for individuals whose brain patterns correlate with aggressive behaviors or control weapons from afar, merely with thought. 17 the, years ago, guys, this, this, yeah. you know, this was in, in concept that long ago. Right. What are the dangers of such information falling into the wrong hands? Hashtag special access programs on a server in a bathroom. And are there any right hands for this kind of knowledge? Mm -hmm. This is where, in my view, the reestablishment of civics will help integrate an appropriate social, ethical, and moral fabric throughout each sovereign respective society. This is where the notion 
of self-government and an appropriately and agreed upon social contract. This is, this is the right hands because through this idea of competition, we will be able to establish what works, what doesn't work. And those that uh, participate in projects that don't work will be allowed to fail. That is, in my view, the only way we get to something close to these technologies being in the right hands. The right hands, in my view, is something that is agreed upon in a social contract that everybody within that society participates in. And that, to me, requires a balance between how a country is run or ruled, because we have many different types of governance. There's totalitarianism, there's monarchies, there's aristocracies, there's oligarchies, there's we the people. And somewhere through that spectrum, the right hands will present itself based on what that society's uh, culture and expectations are for not only themselves, but for their children. That, I, I well, wanted to interject something, now's a good time. That culture and it, I mean, that moral and ethical compass uh, grows organically, springs from family and community, because that's, you know, that's right down at the grassroots. That's where it all should come from. And then it's pushed up to, you know, general uh, national policy or, or, you know, whatever sorts of, of controls, regulations, rules, or limits that, that might, might be there. It's got to spring from that. So however we do it, we've, I, I think it would really be so, so healing and so helpful for peoples all around the world to rediscover uh, the, the beauty and the, the richness of family and community at that local level. Because a lot of these these issues would it would become self explanatory how to how to go forward and how to deal with these things. That's right, and I think the world is going to have this opportunity in the upcoming months and years. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be um, uh, manifest as a result of a whole lot of pain and trauma beyond what everybody has already experienced. But adversity makes men and prosperity makes monsters. And so if you look at our paradigm as a cycle, we are at the point, unfortunately, where a lot of people now have to participate and understand that there's going to be a lot of pain and understand that through that pain, they and their families and their children will learn and hopefully we will make better humans that will understand for a very long time what it means to not violate the prime directive, which is this notion of free will. You know how there's more pain? Seriously, you know how there's more pain? By resisting a, a change or a growth, uh, getting off of a plateau and re going to a, to another level and resisting and resisting and resisting it, that results in protracted pain and deterioration. Whereas just ac acknowledging the, you know, the state of affairs, the state of, of our evolution, if you will, and saying, you know what, there's only one way. We've got to move forward. And then you just do whatever's got to be done and you just get through it. Whereas to languish in either an unawareness or an ignorance, you know, a lot of people don't even want to don't even want to look, entertain the idea that this is the the what we're on the verge of. That is what constitutes a whole lot more pain, in my humble opinion. We see it. It's on the radar. It's here. We got to move forward. Yep. And on that note, this is uh, where. uh the military and society as a whole, uh, this is where we're going. And what, where we're going is this idea of understanding biometrics as big data and using analytics in order to train, monitor, and manage war fighters and the general population. So there's a bunch of stuff in here that 
um, we could read, but I don't want to get bogged down on, I have probably 20 more tabs and I'd like to get into the microwave acoustic effect whereby voice to skull technology, which has been around since the seventies, uh, is, is a very, very real thing. And if we understand that that technology exists, then I think it's a good first step to, um, exposing people to this notion that cell phones are obsolete. They really are. The, the and, first stab at voice to skull, that was way back in Montauk, like 50 years ago, wasn't it? I don't remember exactly. Um, I have an article here that talks about uh, a doctor who was able to um, refine the technology so that it was reproducible enough to show that it's an actual thing. It's tangible. Um, out of this this particular article, I want to read this section right here. DARPA said the program is working to develop technology for analyzing data and information arising from intelligence networks, open and other external sources, sensors, and signal image processors, i.e. your cell phone, and collection platforms and weapon systems, noting that technical challenges include the need to process huge volumes of diverse, incomplete, and uncertain data in tactically relevant timeframes. Now, when you think about tactically relevant timeframes when you're dealing with AI systems running drones and planes and tanks and boats and satellites and people, what do you think a tactically relevant time frame is? As fast as possible. And it's all going to be coordinated by a powerful AI a network of AI parts. Yep. As fast as possible. The U.S. military increasingly operates in remote and unstable parts of the world where mission success depends heavily on cooperation with a wide variety of stakeholder groups on civil, economic, and military matters. And this is where the Chinese unrestricted warfare model comes into play. This is, yeah. this is DARPA and the military understands this notion of unrestricted warfare. and when we look at the, each of these subsections, civil, economic, and military, civil has to do with an individual or a society's culture and belief system. Economic has everything to do with the moving parts in an economy, things like manufacturing, transportation, communications, municipal services like water and power. Military matters, well, we'll let your minds wander on just how awesome our military is. These groups typically include host nation government organizations, local civilian groups, and non-governmental organizations, each of which has priorities, sensitivities, and concerns that may differ significantly. This program will develop tools to create casual computational models, meaning that they run all the time without a whole lot of overhead, that represent the most significant relationships, dynamics, interactions, and uncertainties of the operational environment, including political, military, economic, and social factors. These tools will enable command staffs to design and quantitatively assess potential courses of action in complex environments. And here's where we get into cell phones. The warfighter analytics using smartphones for health, known as WASH. Those of you in the military understand what washing out is, and that is what the intent, in my view, has been since the Biden administration has been in power and with that said, I will read, currently understanding and assessing the readiness of the warfighter involves medical intervention with the help of advanced equipment, such as electrocardiographs and other specialized medical devices that are too expensive and cumbersome to employ continuously or without supervision in non-controlled environments. On the other hand, currently 92% of adults in the United States own a cell phone. 
which could be used as the basis for continuous, passive, health and readiness assessment. Yep. I'm going to read that again. Currently, 92% of adults in the United States own a cell phone, which could be used as the basis for continuous, passive, health and readiness assessments. Readiness. Readiness mm. for what? Yep. The Warfighter Analytics, using smartphones for health program, seeks to use data collected from cell phone sensors to enable novel algorithms that conduct passive, continuous, real-time assessment of the warfighter or the general population. The objective of WASH is to extract physiological signals, your emotions, your heart rate, your breathing, your iris movements, the flushing of your skin, your sweat, everything, everything, your physiological signals, things that are controlled and regulated by your autonomic nervous system. Respiration, blood pressure, sweat, all that stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which may be weak and noisy. And what they mean by that, your physiological signals being measured and extracted by your cell phone may be weak and noisy. What that means is the signal to noise ratio is not good. And that's where the algorithms that conduct passive, continuous, real-time assessment, that's where those algorithms come into play. Yeah, they, they, they clean it up by combining multiple readings and then corroborating them to see if they, they you know, form the composite picture of what would be an accurate assessment of the overall person's state. That's right. On that note, if you're able to collect things from a camera or an infrared laser array, or the microphones, or the speakers, or the antennas. If you're able to do that and build a very good rendered composite of somebody's mood and state, their physiologic state as they move throughout their day, what you're able to do is compare and contrast with big data tables while they're not around their cell phone so that you can use what is existing in the open air environment, something like 5G, to assess with a limited number of sens sensors in order to compare and contrast the big data table about you that has been refined through the multiple aggregation or sensor fusion right. that occurs. Once, once you've already got a basis of the profile of the person, it's very easy to throw some of the noise right out from any particular reading and say, no, 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 this is what the real picture is. It gets better. The more, the more data that's collected into that profile, the more accurate any one little reading that you might get would be. And, and the, the system is going to become very, it is becoming very smart. Very. Yes. So what they're saying here is these weak and noisy signals that are embedded in the data obtained through existing mobile device sensors, existing, existing mobile device sensors, things like an accelerometer, a screen, or a microphone, these are the watered-down general knowledge, general understanding of the public's um, knowledge base at this point. Such extractions and analysis done on a continuous basis may help determine current health status and identify latent or developing health disorders. And this gets into this notion of pre-crime, guilty until proven innocent in order to protect and serve the public good. And so you have here a basic diagram of the overarching premise of this program, biologic onset of disease or illness, uh, uh, neuro disease, things like depression and aggression fall into this category. Mm -hmm. This program is able to detect the variety of symptoms and a noticeable emergence of symptoms. So this program research, WASH research will explore the development of algorithms and techniques for identifying both known indicators of physiological problems, such as disease, illness, and or injury, and deviations from the warfighter's micro behaviors, micro behaviors that could indicate such problems. 
It is also expected that additional digital biomarkers, digital biomarkers. Hmm. I'm thinking about what that means. Okay, go on. Of physiological problems may be identified during the research through the combination of big data analytics and medical ground truth provided to performers. Digital biomarkers are consumer-generated physiological and behavioral measures collected through connected digital tools. And in this case, it's a smartphone. Let's not get into graphene. We'll go back to graphene at some point. A prerequisite for the extraction and interpretation of the raw sensor data and any identified digital biomarkers is determining the context of such data, collection and analysis, which may affect the relevance of any given sensor and permit denoising. So what they're getting at here is exactly what we were talking about earlier where you're able to collect raw data from a variety of sensors, fuse it through big data and artificial intelligence, ultimately yielding very, very good analytics that allow for this notion of denoising or the elimination of irrelevant or misleading readings. Yep. And and as far as the as far as the graphene or the graphene oxide thing, I mean, just to dispense with that quickly, because I don't think we'll have time to get into that at all tonight. It's just all that is is a molecular platform for interface at various levels for whatever purpose. That's all it is. It's it's just it's just a molecular tool. Yep, it's a it's a superconductor that yeah. controls the directionality of electrons. And um, it's a key component to building biodigital circuits that are, to some extent, biostable. And other components that can be fused together allow for power harvesting from either electromagnetics, ultrasonics, photonics, or even your own body temperature or the change in your pH or something like um, fluid dynamics i.e. your blood pulsing through your veins. And, and if they didn't do it with graphene or graphene oxide, if you will, they'd do it with something else, you know, just that they'd use something else as that molecular interface medium. But it just so happens that that is out there and it's, uh, it, it, it seems to be quite favorable with its characteristics to be able to do some of these things. Correct. Particularly because it's easily bonded to and it's cheap other... to make. Yep. That's right. And that. Yep. That's right. The key focus areas of this program, WASH, will be the extraction of signals and the identification of complicated actions and environmental variables. Uh, if <laughs> the union of personal behavior characteristics, smartphone sensor collection, context of smartphone use, and disease biomarkers will define preclinical health. And so let's look at this real briefly. Your phone studies your eye movement, your voice, device orientation, GPS location, finger images, heart rhythm, application use patterns. What apps do you use? What do you do when you're on the different apps? Behavior. Mm -hmm. Gesture and finger pressure, grasping pattern, hand movement, your gait, which is how you walk, the speed at which you walk, your body motion, facial recognition, full and partial. Here's some of the sensors that they are telling the public about. Your camera, a pedometer, a light sensor, a thermometer, a fingerprint sensor, a proximity sensor, a magnemometer, which is something that's designed to measure magnetic fields, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a microphone. Context of use. When you're using your phone, where you're at, how you're oriented, etc. Whether you're falling, kneeling, laying, whatever. What you're doing at work, driving, and whatever. That sleeping. Is. That's sleeping. Bottom one sleeping. I get that. That's, that's good. Disease and biomarkers, 
physiological and cognitive symptoms, excessive sweating, shaking voice, hands shaking, muscle tension, mm, facial tics, racing heartbeat, blood pressure, facial freezing, a change in how you walk, a gait variance, decreased attention and concentration, communication variance, diminished reasoning ability, poor decision-making, impulsive actions. Those last few on the bottom of that list, that, that, would, that would be deduced from how you interacted with the apps on the phone. Decreased attention or advanced and ex accentuated concentration. Uh, diminished reasoning ability. There may be a little challenge that the app puts to you, and it may be just part of the way it works and how well you make it through successfully using the app. And then decision-making. They, they could even be some, uh, some phantom decision choices that are just there to test your yeah. ability to make something. You know, yeah, something like um, an app that loads slowly or Twitter yep. um, when you're browsing through tweets and you go back to the main tweet feed and it scrolls away from you. Yep. Did it scroll yep. up or scroll down? And then a measure of your frustration and your ability to assess how Pull to in the physiologicals. Yep. yep. Correct. And so this is this idea of probing or sending out pings or pulses and then measuring a physiologic response to understand some type of physiological or psychological uh, Man, com component. It's so powerful. Yeah. You put that thing in your hand and you start working with it. Wow. Whoa. Yep. What that can learn from you. This shows well, for entertainment purposes only, but hey, I'm, you know. Yeah. So here's another article or a article about this um, warfighter analytics and for smartphone healthcare technology we are creating through wash will discover predictive patterns in massive data sets in real time and is bound to be transformative. And we're not going to really dig too much into this, but they're talking about engineering of smartphone sensor data, statistical modeling of personal behavior. Yep, that's important. Detection of higher order activity states from low level signals. That is amazing. Detection of higher order activity states from low level signals. And this goes back to that signal to noise ratio and being able to clean up a signal to understand the finer nuances of what's going on in your brain and your body. Yep. Machine and deep learning of robust outliers or deviations from normal healthy behavior. And this is where we get into this uh, um, debate, if you will, of what is the military's role? Is it the military's role to implement political ideologies throughout the base of the military and by extension society, because if it becomes generally accepted that the military will allow or disallow soldiers to participate based on their political ideology, that will then trickle down into the general population as parents raise their children. This is a major, major problem. And this is how you subvert a country. This is how you erode away the military in a very uh, covert way. It also helps you design the, the profiles of those military personnel exactly the way that you want them to be. Very good. That's right. So some better pictures, fall detection, sleep disturbances, depression, machine learning, and you get a bio score. How lovely, a bio score. Here's another cool little oh, graphic. Enlarge that one, yeah. Yeah. Smartphone data, location, calls, accelerometer, user activity, daily sedentary time, how long you sleep, whether or not you're up at night browsing, max radius from home, hmm. location tracking, and all these things fused together, statistical analysis to understand things like your physical activity, uh, short dimension of anger reaction, insomnia, depression, 
sleep disturbances, irritability. This is, this is what, in my view, is being done or has been done uh, to everybody, troops included. There's one more here. Let's see what it says. And this is some, these are some graphics that provide two-dimensional understanding of big data and the real future uh, with groups like Space Force will take a lot of these two-dimensional components and fuse them into a three-dimensional environment that with the use of um, augmented reality and virtual reality, uh, we'll be able to make very, very um, clean, quick, concise assessments rather than having to flip through 20 pages of a presentation with augmented reality. They would be able to assess 20 pages of information, so to speak, by rotating an image around in a few seconds rather than reading for five minutes. And so when you're looking at this idea of fusing AI and humans into the battle space, being able to create an environment that can consolidate information in such a way to allow humans to continue to have some, hopefully all, control over autonomous weapon systems, three-dimensional modeling and uh, augmented reality are absolutely necessary and how that's deployed is going to be um uh risky potentially dangerous because as these technologies evolve i think it will become more expedient to just have direct stimulation to the visual and audio cortex and the motor sensory functions in the brain rather than having a soldier in Space Force, for example, put on VR goggles and a haptic suit to be able to remotely log into somebody else's brain or to simulate being in the cockpit of an autonomous vehicle. Yep. Define, define haptic suit just for everybody, just in sure. case. A haptic suit would be something that you put on that provides some type of a stimulation to the um, skin. And there are receptors in the skin that do a variety of things. They understand heat. They understand pain. They understand pressure. They understand um, hydration. All of these things can be simulated to some extent with a haptic suit. So the haptic suit could have... Um, mechanical actuators on it that provide haptic feedback like with your phone when when you type on your phone or you have your phone on silent you get the the vibrations if you will Please that yeah. right and the same suit could in fact have um, thermal components in it and or um, transmitters that artificially provide the sensation of pain or pleasure for that matter and, and if we get into uh, DARPA's um, science behind decoding the peripheral and central nervous system, um, some of what we're talking about will make a whole lot more sense. Um, for those of you that um, haven't uh, been exposed to the decoding of uh, neural code, biological code, and the, the genetic implementations of this, in my view, is just a, uh, an evolution of what has been, in my view, existing for a very long time, whereby uh, connected devices have gone from being away from a person to very close to a person to then being worn on the person and ultimately moving into being infused within and throughout a person. And that's where, that's where our species is going. Who knows how that's going to go. So these are some people and some cool highlights here. Classifying depression in imbalanced data sets using an autoencoder based anomaly detection approach. Identifying mislabeled human behavioral context data using visual analytics and get up, assessing postural activity and transitions using bi-directional gated current units 
on smartphone motion data. Mislabeled human context detection using multi-feature similarity linking. Ah, error rejection there on that one. Mm -hmm. Millions of dollars that they're telling us about. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. So let's go to the next one. You can do a lot of good work with 10 or $20 million. <clears throat> yeah, we'll see uh, after October, <laughs> based on what the Fed's saying. So that's a whole nother discussion. Detection and computational analysis of physiological signals. Psychological DC. signals. Thank you. Psychological signals, DCAPs. Researching, advancing research in the arts for health and well being across the military continuum back in 2015. Computationally based network tools assess and analyze psychological behavioral states in the Department of Defense medical environment, analyze verbal and nonverbal cues, online activities, and indicators of social behavior. Employ approaches both individually and in concert. Use novel sources of data, iPhone, Android, Xbox Connect, hmm. social networks, synthetic environments, electroencephalograms, webcams, and more. Yep, it was novel in 2015. Now it's, it's really part of the main, the main stay of, of the way that this is employed. Leverage expertise from MIT, Dartmouth, Boston, University, Vanderbilt, which these guys are really into optogenetics, I think. USC and UCLA, University of Southern California, University of California, Los Angeles. And what you see here are things that we all buy each other for Christmas. Early recognition indicators of psychological distress, depression, anxiety, or PTSD. More effective triage of potentially distressed service members because it's for your safety. Facilitate clinician training. Mm. Share DCAPS insights and data with the scientific community. Virtual humans may reduce stress and fear of judgment. Virtual humans wow. may reduce stress and fear of judgment. Specific applications, behavioral assessment, and monitoring of military personnel before, during, and after deployment. Deployed to clinician training sites, call centers, and hotlines. Honest signal theory. Hmm. Spoken and written communications, including metadata, mm. online behaviors, email, surfing habits, games, and social networking, nonverbal cues, things like facial expressions, posture, movement patterns, creative content of artistic expression in art and writing, response to stimuli obtained through sensors such as EEG, EKG, and GSR. This is electroencephalography, your brain waves electrocardiograms, which is the electrical activity of your heart, and your galvanic skin response, which has to deal or do with moisture content and a measurement of electrical Emotion. conductivity. Yep. Electrical conductivity in your skin. Yep. Extrapolates to stress, relaxation, emotion. Exactly. Um, and, and, and although they, although, you know, this continually refers to the, the war fighter or the soldier, every single piece of this can be bridged over to the consumer environment, every single application specification mm -hmm. here. Yeah. That's the, uh, the underlying premise in my view of the Silicon Valley. Right. And it was this notion to commercialize and deploy in a very sophisticated way. Um, this infusion of biometric uh, analytics using the internet and the rollout of all of this technology has been done in such a way so that the general public uh, funds and supports the further development of these technologies through the purchasing of consumer devices. 
So beyond what we pay in taxes, which is then siphoned off for these programs, you have this idea of building consumer applications in a consumer environment to further fund these types of technological developments and advancements. So this, there's more on this article, but let's... This is good stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I sent you a lot of this, so feel free to put it in the, in the, the show notes. Will do. Psychological sensors to be incorporated in telehealth for service members. This was back in 2012. A new telehealth sensing technology will enable providers to remotely monitor physiological and behavioral health status of U.S. service members. MIT, Cognito, DARPA, University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies, just on and on and on. Um, mental disorders continue to rank among the top health problems worldwide in terms of cost to society. In the U.S., depression affects 16% of adults or 32 million people in their lifetime. This was back in 2020. Depression is also significantly higher in people diagnosed with chronic conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, or obesity. Recent studies estimate that between 40% to 60% of individuals diagnosed with chronic conditions also suffer from depression. This is where uh, pain management and other types of chronic diseases that manifest through things like GMO food, mm -hmm. chemtrails, contaminated mm -hmm. water, um, contaminated medications, improper diagnosis, and or the stacking of medications, what would be known as contraindications, all of these things are the underpinning or the substrate that then manifests chronic conditions that contribute to depression. And well, it's if, 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 if you have a healthcare uh, establishment or, or set, of, uh, set of organizations which tend to perpetuate maintaining a person at a level of sickness or illness or unwellness versus actually making them healthy, and if it wasn't like that, then perhaps that 40 to 60% of those individuals would not be suffering from some sort of a mild psychological disorder such as depression because they wouldn't have diabetes or heart disease or obesity because they'd be physically healthy. So it would actually eliminate a whole lot of psychiatric disorder. That's right. When you get hurt or you are betrayed or you have some chronic illness, your psyche is impacted by that because of course it is right because you you have this constant assessment of self what you want to do versus what you can do <clears throat> and that changes as you age and as you um degenerate and that's just a natural part of aging and so this idea of dis-ease where you have a lack of um, equilibrium or homeostasis in your body, otherwise known as dis-ease, that affects your perception of self because you no longer are able to manifest. To do and be the way you want to be. Correct. So if you're physically unwell, that's certainly going to make somebody depressed. I mean, it would make me that way. It's right. Sense. It's Right. It lowers your ability to be the best that you can be. And especially for the military and the higher, higher trained military, like spec op guys, when, when you're young and able <laughs> and you're convinced through training and through your own uh, personal actions that you're, for lack of a better, better word, invincible, as those individuals start to age out, um, it, it, it has a major psychological impact. And if these technologies are used uh, maliciously, then 
all of those negative emotions that result in things like depression Amplified. can be exacerbated and accelerated yep. that ultimately lead to self-termination and yep. the, the benevolent or beneficial use of the technologies that we talk about frequently could allow for an augmented enhancement of these individuals to allow them to take everything that they've learned and apply it to their communities and to their families, which would then grow the next crop or the next generation of people willing to volunteer to continue the preservation of freedom. Yep. It's a tremendous resource that shouldn't be wasted and should be preserved. That experience, that, that, that life knowledge that those people have, that should be cared for and guarded and protected and, and supported. Mm -hmm. Just opinion. So let's see. This is from MIT. Four ways to upgrade the brain, right? In the digital age. And this is just a, we'll just briefly go through this. Prioritize scalable solutions. Effective, efficient brain healthcare must be seen not as a luxury, but as a necessity. Now you can you can take this and, and interpret it however you want. And it really goes back to how are these tools implemented. The luxury piece, I think, is a constant due to our current environment, whereby those in executive level positions, those in monarchies or oligarchies or whatever, have access to the beneficial um, components of this technology. They, in turn, are um, also primary targets for offense when projecting power outward. So that in and of itself is a double-edged sword. TMC, look at bullet point number one right there. Yeah. Learning and cognitive disabilities are becoming increasingly prevalent among children. Yeah. Whoa. Kids are the ones that are ones that, that they are the most fertile brains to grasp and understand things that adults can't even figure out anymore because we've become so habituated in our thought patterns. If we got that problem that is growing in children with cognitive disabilities, we got a problem here, guys. This has to do with uh, overstimulation and the constant um, invasion of the nuclear family. And what I mean by that is the education system trains teachers and those teachers are taught that they have a higher authority than the parent. So if you overstimulate a young brain and then overlay that with this idea of some, someone or something else having a higher authority than the parent, then the natural evolutionary process of, of, of our species is in direct conflict with that model. Children are supposed to have uh, parental um, uh, mentorship as a cornerstone or a foundation for everything else that they encounter in their lives. That's the psychological, sociological piece. But there's more, you know, there's that whole business of the the uh, the physical environment, the 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 food, the water, everything. That thing that begins with a V that we won't say, you know, all yeah. that stuff. And and this notion of putting a computer or an iPad in every child's hands. Yeah, overstimulate. Yep. And yep. the overstimulation is audio and visual, but as we move forward with our discussions, um, you'll see that uh, electromagnetics and ultrasound and light can also overstimulate um, in, a, in a subliminal or a subconscious way that um, is, is very destructive at this point. And that's something that Cyber Command needs to um, hurry up and fix. Uh, so it says here, among adults, over 300 million people suffer from depression, uh, not to mention substance abuse and other mental health conditions. Among older adults, staying mentally sharp and addressing aging-related cognitive decline and neurodegenerative disease are top priorities, especially given extended life expectancy. So let's see what else is in here. Harness lifelong neuroplasticity. 
every man can, if he so desires, become the sculptor of his own brain. And I believe that. And this has to do with this notion of self looking at self and understanding what you can do in your environment. I'm still on the piece with kids, okay? You know, you might not think of it when you look at a very active, energetic kid, but, you know, they actually can have a peaceful space in their mind in which they are just aware and discovering and very perceptive of the environment around them. And if they're overstimulated in their, in their, their, it, it, with whether it be with electromagnetics or ultrasonics or with just plain the media that's blaring at them in that palm-held device that they're using, that interferes with their peaceful and even at the level of a child, semi-meditative state of discovery of everything around them because there's just way too much input. It's, it's basically to your point. It's just another way of framing it. Yeah. I want to, I want to read this paragraph here because anybody out there who thinks that you've reached the apex of your life and that it's all downhill, I, I intrinsically disagree with you. Um, and this has to do with uh, people who retire. You can look up the stats on people that retire and those that die very shortly after and those that do not. And the real delineation there is those that um, have a life uh, of being sedentary typically don't do very well after retirement. Those that have hobbies and those that are engaged in family and friends and things like music will continue to live because there is an intrinsic reason to continue living. With that said, much recent innovation is enabled by the core fact that the human brain continually changes itself through experience. This is called neuroplasticity or brain plasticity. For a long time, conventional wisdom held that after a certain age, the brain became fixed but scientists and patients now know the brain never stops changing. The brain is able to rewire itself based on experience by, among other factors, generating new neurons and forming new connections between neurons. So this idea of how do we get our arms wrapped around the best way to harness neuroplasticity to help us lead better lives, enhance our brains, and delay brain health decline. It says here, progress has been made. We know that strengthening specific circuits of the brain through education, lifestyle, and targeted intervention, such as neurostimulation, can help us learn faster and become more resilient to brain decline. But these solutions have not yet harnessed the full potential of neuroplasticity to revive brain health around the world. And here's where we get into AI. Harness pervasive technologies and artificial intelligence. We are witnessing the coming age of a very promising data-driven brain health toolkit enabling easier access to meditation and mindfulness practices via apps and bio neural feedback, personalized medicine and increased adherence via gamification and AI. I want to stop here and, and just think about this idea of gamification and AI. And this goes back to what I said earlier about people who think they've reached the apex of their life. And what that is, is this notion of I have gone through my usable life expectancy and therefore I am no longer in the game. And the game is life and life is war. Everything is war. And this idea of war is how do I exert influence within my own sphere of influence? So personalized medicine and increased adherence via gamification and AI simply means the use of technology in constructive and healthy ways in order to enable people to continue to want to live. Sensor motor 
sensory motor and physiological improvements via virtual and augmented reality. And what I understand from this is something like as you age, your ability to maintain your sense of balance goes away because everything in your body breaks down, your nervous system, your muscles, everything. Virtual and augmented reality may provide opportunity for things like assistance with balance so that you can maintain nervous system and muscle mass functionality. If these technologies were offered, what you would have is the ability for grandparents to oversee children while the youth, meaning those of working age, can continue to be productive members of society. What that will enable is a transference of knowledge and ideas from those who have lived longer than those who are in the workforce, transferring knowledge and ideas to the young. If that is done in a constructive way, what we get is rapid advancement in every way. Non-invasive real-time brain monitoring and enhancement, enabling better diagnostics, treatments, and prevention strategies. Keep in mind, we're talking about cell phones. So there's other things here that we'll um, kind of just breeze through here for posterity's sake, and we will move to the next tab. So I found this earlier, correcting the brain, the convergence of neuroscience, neurotechnology, psychiatry, and artificial intelligence in 2020. The incorporation of neural-based technologies into psychiatry offer novel means to use neural data in patient assessments and clinical diagnosis. However, an over-optimistic technologician of neuroscientifically informed psychiatry risks the conflation of technological and psychological norms. Neurotechnologies promise fast, efficient, broad psychiatric insights not readily available through conventional observation of patients. Mm, it's true. Recording and processing brain signals provides information from beneath the skull that can be interpreted as an account of neural processing and that can provide a basis to evaluate general behavior and functioning. But it ought not be forgotten that the use of such technologies is part of a human practice of neuroscience informed psychiatry. This paper notes some challenges in the integration of neural technologies into psychiatry and suggests vigilance, particularly in respect to normative challenges. In this way, psychiatry can avoid a drift towards reductive technological approaches while nonetheless benefiting from promising advances in neuroscience and technology. And we're not going to read this paper, but just understand that this idea of fusing man and machine and the, the field of psychology, psychiatry, etc. All of these things intermix and these are these are the new um, uh, this is the new priest class, the technologists, the psychiatrists and the academics and the doctors, medical doctors. These are the people that we are taught to revere without question. And I have no problem with holding up an individual or a school or an institution if in fact they're worthy of such reverence. The part I have a problem is with is this notion of without question. And that is what is being engineered out of our species is this notion of questioning what if And we'll continue. Some of the publications that uh, I found, John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. 
beyond intuitive anthropomorphic control, recent achievements using brain-computer interface technologies, chronic intracortical recordings from micro or nano electrode arrays implanted in marmosets. Mm. Yeah, marmosets. And further along, you'll see that um, they correlate marmoset neural function with human neural function, but that's anyway, common marmoset as primate model for behavioral neuroscience studies. So this is just the next step, primates, then humans. Comparison of pattern recognition control, um, understanding prosthetic limb movements, eye flight project, identifying markers of cognitive workload, how much your brain is tasked while you're performing some function and doing this non-invasively. Flight simulation using brain-computer interfaces. Clinical evaluation of modular prosthetic limb systems for upper extremity amputees. Modular prosthetic limb systems, there's the link for it. Load and torque characteristics of an upper limb. Mm. Now, if you are able to map the nervous system so that you can fuse a prosthetic onto a limb that has been amputated or blown off or whatever. And you can translate the right bio digital code to the brain and you can decode the brain in such a way to be able to apply the right pressures or the right sensations or the right whatever's to have that prosthetic limb function like a real limb. What's stopping the next evolution of that which is a completely intact human overriding the nervous system to then drive motor function, i.e. artificially moving a hand or a limb or a foot, which would be something like a super soldier program so that you can enhance somebody's ability to run, jump, see, smell, taste, touch, all of it. It's easy. It's the next evolution of that. It's the same. It's the almost the same technology. It's Precisely. Easy. It's also possible to overdrive the individual's somatic structure, and they they might even wind up breaking bones or limbs or whatever. But That's you right. Can drive them to the point that you can get them to accomplish the mission. That's right. And in my view, based on mission requirements, it would be absolutely worth it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely worth it. Mm-hmm. Uh, motor cortex. One, yeah, you're yeah. getting to it. You're getting there. Motor cortex spiking and local field potentials during a reaching task in common marmosets. This is where they're literally measuring the brainwave patterns and the neural patterns in the brain during um, f- motion, during free moving motion. We are. <laughs> We are we are already in the future, folks. This stuff is pub. This is publicly available information, and so if if you can extrapolate how far ahead national security research and development is, we're already here. This is publicly available information that I'm showing you. Don't skip that next one. Navigating a virtual environment using intracortical microstimulation of the human somatosensory cortex. So this implies however you do it, it could be with microelectrodes. Uh, it might not require that, though. Uh, maybe a few implants. Microstimulation of the somatosensory cortex would be possible with millimeter wave technology. I have tabs open that discuss this idea of um, millimeter waves being absorbed into the skin in such a way that the amount of energy that can be transmitted far exceeds what is currently regulated by the FCC and ANSI simply because 
those regulations are centered around what they call SAR, the specific absorption rate. And that has everything to do with the amount of heating that occurs when electromagnetic energy is applied to the body. Because millimeter waves don't penetrate the body the same way that microwaves do, the amount of power that can be output into the environment and therefore into or onto a human far exceeds what is allowable with microwaves or shortwave or ELF or ULF. These are not regulated. And they, in my view, have been omitted from regulation on purpose because in further research, looking at millimeter waves, when you start interacting with <clears throat> the somasensory cortex, i.e. the peripheral nervous system through things like your skin, you can begin to start modulating the peripheral nervous system, which is in direct connection with your central nervous system and your brain. And in my view, this is why the FCC and big telecom and lobbyists need to be investigated thoroughly, thoroughly. By the way, uh, Bill Barr, the former uh, head of uh, DOJ, I believe, uh, he was a former executive lawyer for Verizon and they have direct affiliates with GTE, and GTE um, is uh, or has major connections in Chicago, which is uh, where Hillary Clinton's family is from. And it also, GTE also has direct connections and partnerships with Canadian infrastructure in both communications and power. Everybody's focused on the southern border, and in the virtual environment, the northern border is just as exposed through our power grids and our communication grids. On that note, an objective classifier of expertise in the United States Marine Corps combat aviators. This is where we get to this notion of fusing man and machine, particularly in airplanes, so that a single pilot can manage their own plane and a variety of other planes that support that pilot. And what that does is increase your combat effectiveness, meaning you get additional payloads for weapons delivery. And that could be conventional missiles and bombs. It can be directed energy systems, either lasers or microwaves or millimeter waves or ultrasonics. And if you're able to have multiple aircraft that are fused in with a pilot, now you can extrapolate out a fleet or a fighter wing of pilots that might consist of six pilots who then have control of six of their own planes. Each and so the multiplier effect of AI and uh, fusing drones in with, with the human brain offers a whole lot of asymmetrical advantage. And this is where uh, the future of warfare is going. And this is where I think the... Um, American model will ultimately win over something like the Chinese model because you're going to have AI hopefully augmenting the decision making of a well trained Marine Corps aviator versus the China model that drives ultimate compliance and subservience. And in that model, the China model will, in my view, slow the decision-making capability of a human pilot simply because they were taught out of fear rather than being taught to ultimately win. And that requires a cooperative effort of individual brains working together. 
And that is the underpinning essence of a volunteer army or a volunteer military is this notion that we have individuals that understand they are becoming part of a collective that will take orders provided that they are constitutional to then serve something higher than themselves. And that is antithetical to the Chinese model. And in my view, that's why free societies will win. Targeted transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation for phantom limb sensory feedback. And we'll get into DARPA's uh, prosthetics programs at some point. On that note, papers by revolutioning prosthetics team members. More about the brain and brain computer interfaces. Listen to this. Towards a brain computer interface for dexterous control of multi fingered prosthetic hands. We've shown videos of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Decoding individuated finger movements using volume constrained neuronal ensembles. What this means is that machine learning, big data, et cetera, are able to understand whether or not you're using your pointer finger, your middle finger, your ring finger, your pinky finger, or your thumb. Being able to understand each individual digit of your hand. That is amazing in my view. Electrocortographic amplitude predicts finger positions during slow grasping motions of the hand. This is back in 2010. Great research and, they were doing. And 2008. Yep. This is over a decade ago. And this is publicly available information, folks. This is way... <laughs> the technology is so far beyond what we're looking at, in my view. It, it's, it's scary um, because... There is no regulation, and the people who control the entities that control this stuff um, are, are um, multinational monolithic corporations that function above governments, and they need to be put in check, like right now. Free-paced, high-performance brain-computer interfaces, asynchronous decoding of dexterous finger movements using M1 neurons, closed-loop decoding, which means it's all done locally. Closed-loop means you have a stimulus or you exert a stimulus. It's measured and monitored, and then feedback is put right back into the system to modify, alter, improve, correct, or deter the next stimulus. And we're at the point where all of this is done in the body. Closed loop decoding of dexterous hand movements using a virtual integration environment. Cortical decoding of individual finger and wrist kinematics for an upper limb neuroprosthesis. Muscle synergies as a predictive framework for the electromyography patterns of new hand postures. This EMG is the measurement of the electrical signals when your muscles engage and disengage. There is uh, a lot of research being done on that. You can look up Control Labs, CTRL Labs. They were recently purchased by Facebook. And that technology measures the muscle electricity to then monitor, access, uh, and potentially stimulate your brain. And Facebook now owns all of that technology. And Thomas Reardon, who is the CEO of Control Labs, came out of the uh, engineering group at Microsoft. So all of these disgusting people the CEOs, I mean, are um, they're in bed with each other, probably literally, because that's how power is ultimately uh, shared. But it's okay. 
because they all wear pink sweaters. Intention, action planning, and decision making in parietal frontal circuits. Mm. This is the logic and planning and critical thinking parts of your brain, the parietal frontal circuits. So we can digress on about light for a minute. The infrared laser systems with something like face ID penetrate your skin and your skull and go right into your brain. And in my view, these systems are able to look at not only your eyes and your face and your lips and your voice and everything else, they can also look at the neural patterns, the neural firing patterns in the front part of your brain with the laser systems on your phone. Just my opinion. And at some point, hopefully we'll be able to talk in greater detail about that. Um, this goes on and on and on. Let's, uh, let's move on. You can see this document is full of interesting, interesting links. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so. Yep, that's about right. We'll stop here and maybe continue with uh, Voice to Skull next week. I want to take some time on this document. Accidental FOIA reveals mind control documents. Here's further evidence that this technology exists. April 21st, 2018. It says here, journalist Curtis Waltman filed a Freedom of Information Act request with Washington State Fusion Center, partnered with Department of Homeland Security, to obtain information about Antifa and white supremacist groups. Instead of getting information on how the agency targets the groups, he got way more than the information he was looking for. Curtis was accidentally sent a mysterious file with the label EM, electromagnetic effects, on human body. The file included methods of remote mind control. And what I want to show you is this diagram here that is very, very interesting. Electromagnetic effects can do things like forced memory blanking and induced erroneous actions meaning actions that you would otherwise not have taken, induced changes to hearing, both apparent, direction, and volume, meaning where the sound is coming from, how loud it is, and that it is noticeable. And sometimes even content, meaning a particular theme or a particular statement. Sudden violent itching inside the eyelids, forced manipulation of airways, including externally controlled forced speech, wildly racing heart without cause, remote induced violent, no rash itching with preferences for hard to reach areas, often during delicate or messy work. This would be bad if you were a cook all the way up to a heart surgeon. Forced nudging of arms during delicate or messy work, causing injury or spills. Also detrimental if you are something like a cook, all the way up to an open heart surgeon. Special attention given to the genital area, itching, forced orgasms, or intense pain. Intense general pain or hot needles pushed deep into flesh sensations. Also, wild flailing, sometimes followed by short periods of rigor mortis, which is this idea of paralysis of your nervous system. Hard to reach itch site top and bottom. Never any rash, which often starts as the sensation of small electrical shocks. 
demo neuro control by bending each toe backwards almost 90 degrees one at a time over a couple of minutes. Reading and broadcasting thoughts, controlled dreams, forced waking visions, sometimes synced with body motion, microwave hearing, which we need to discuss very soon, sir. Mm -hmm. Transparent eyelids. That's like my eyes are open, but I see nothing but black. That would be fun if you're driving. Not really. Artificial tinnitus. Forced movement of jaw and clacking of teeth. Forced muscle quaking of the large muscles on the back. Forced precision manipulation of hands. Sometimes synced to the forced waking visions. And this asterisk up here about microwave hearing which we'll get into hopefully next week. The first unclassified successful transmission of the human voice directly into the skull of a living person was performed by Dr. Joseph C. Sharp of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in 1974 by transforming a hypnotist voice using the Lowry silent sound or Smirnov scramble method used in the Gulf War. It is possible to hypnotize a target without the target being aware from hiding, leaving zero trace evidence. General effects of electromagnetic radiation on humans, sudden overheating, all body pain, forced caffeine field, sleep mm -hmm. prevention, Forced drop in your tracks, sleep inducement. That would also be fun if you're driving a car. Not really. Irresistible go here, go there commands. Microwave burns, electric shocks. Involuntary test subjects also experience frequent break and enters at home and at work with clothing and furniture business papers, computer files, sabotaged, modified, or stolen. Physiological warfare research is the likely motive. Psychoelectronic weapon effects. Last diagram here. These are blurry, so it's not your phones or your computers, folks. It's not too bad. Mass and individual remote mind control via mobile phone networks and mobile phones. Individual remote mind control via mobile psychotronic weapons carriers disguised as communication vehicles. Oh, boy. Individual and group mind control via black helicopters carrying psychotronic weapons. Brain areas of interest, motor control cortex, 10 hertz, auditory cortex, which is your ears. 15 hertz visual cortex at 25 hertz that's Look what you that. see soma sensory what you can sense or feel 9 hertz and your thought center 20 hertz information induced through modulation the motor cortex motor impulse coordination the auditory cortex sounds which bypasses the ears visual cortex images in the brain bypassing the eyes Soma sensory cortex, phantom touches, thought centers, imposed subconscious thought. At 20 hertz. Yeah. Mm. Extremely that, low frequency brain stimulation. They've got a whole table of frequencies to use mm -hmm. there. Really something. <laughs> this is where we are, folks, for your entertainment purposes only. Any last comments anywhere around, uh, either on this side of the screen or the other side of the screen? Been uh, watching and, uh, and talking with you all, and that's been pretty active. I encourage you all to share as much as you can uh, this channel and uh, humaninternet.org and humaninternet1 on Twitter. 
uh, human internet on Telegram, cyber human frontiers on Telegram. Um, the the battle space is heating up, and uh, we need to share as much as possible, as fast as possible, so that we survive for your entertainment purposes only. Thanks to everybody for uh, for joining us. Uh, we got to be brave, but uh, we uh, we haven't uh, we haven't given up the ghost here by any means. Oh no, this is seriously. Uh, we're on the verge of one of the greatest times in at least that I know of in the uh, history of mankind that I've been allowed to be aware of. You know that hasn't perhaps been uh, hidden or obstructed from my learning about it. So it's really really. Uh, we're on the verge of what could be a fantastic time. So thanks. Carry on bravely. Night, everybody. <laughs>